According to the FBI, 27% of crimes which escalated to homicides were committed by strangers. The other 73% of homicides were committed by people who the victims knew. But when 18-year-old Naomi Irian was abducted by a hooded figure from a Walmart parking lot in Fernley, Nevada, the detectives were left confused. Was Naomi abducted by someone that she knew, or was it a kidnap for ransom situation? Time was running out and the detectives needed to locate Naomi quickly before something terrible happened to her. But as more and more details surfaced, and eventually Naomi's lifeless body was discovered more than two weeks later, everyone was left in a haze of perpetual fear. The tragic case of Naomi Irian is not only frightening, but it's a nightmarish depiction of someone being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And sadly, Naomi became the target of a monster. Welcome to True Crime Stories. If you're new here, I post new true crime cases every single week with none of those crappy AI narrations, just you, me, and a case to solve. So if you want to see some good old fashioned true crime documentaries, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and it'll keep you up to date with all of my future videos. Naomi Erian was born on July 25th, 2004 to parents Diana and Herb Erian. Diana defined Naomi as her rainbow baby. See, Herb and Diana fell pregnant with a boy, but tragically passed away during infancy back in 2002. His name was Sean, and they were obviously devastated, but Diana soon found out that she was pregnant again. As elated as the couple was, this pregnancy was a hard one. Diana recalled that up until the final remaining weeks of her pregnancy, there was no amniotic fluid in her womb. At the time of the delivery, the Aryan family was expecting the worst, but when Diana's ears rang with the shrill yet harmonious crying of a perfectly healthy baby, she knew that Naomi was, in their eyes, a miracle baby. As she grew up, Naomi shared a close bond with her family, and she loved them more than anything. Life for Naomi was adventurous from the get-go, but not in the ways you might think. Naomi's dad, her, was a foreign expat for the U.S. State Department, and the Aryan family moved all across the globe. Naomi lived in France, Russia, Germany, and South Africa, where she attended the American International School of Johannesburg and graduated in 2021. Even though Naomi lived in a strict and conservative household where routines were the norm, she thoroughly enjoyed it and savored every speculative venture and freedom that she got. When Naomi was an adult, she made the decision to leave her family in South Africa and move to the United States, Nevada to be exact. And this is where the rest of the case takes place. According to Casey, Naomi's brother, Naomi viewed her move to Nevada as a launch pad for her adult life. She also got a job at Panasonic in the battery manufacturing department in the Reno Tahoe area. Naomi was a very responsible girl for her age of 18, and she had dreams of saving up money to buy a place of her own, but was renting in the meantime. But March of 2022 would change everything for Naomi, but not in a good way because while waiting for her job shuttle to come pick her up and take her to the Panasonic plant, Naomi was kidnapped and never seen again. Naomi's job at Panasonic was a bit different. She didn't have to drive to and from work because the factory was at a remote location. A company shuttle would pick her up from a Walmart parking lot in Fernley, Nevada, and it would then take her to work and drop her off after her shift at Panasonic in Reno. Naomi always had her car parked in the same place in the Walmart parking lot, so that she could easily hop in and head home at the end of the day. It was pretty much a standard routine for Naomi, who'd been working at Panasonic for quite some time now. March 12th of 2022 was another workday for Naomi, and it started quite early. Naomi woke up early in the morning, got dressed in a blue company shirt, gray sweater, and dark boots, and gray sweatpants, and grabbed her belongings, climbed in the car, and went straight to the Walmart, for where she was due to be picked up soon. At around 5 a.m., CCTV security footage caught Naomi parking her car in the parking lot, and she was also seen inside a gas station, getting a few snacks for herself. Afterwards, Naomi climbed back into her car, and cell phone activity showed that she was on Snapchat from 5.09 to 5.23 a.m., while waiting for her shuttle to come and pick her up. But what was bizarre was the fact that just a few minutes later, witnesses saw Naomi's car pulling out of the parking lot, but the driver wasn't Naomi. It was a man wearing a dark hooded sweatshirt. As soon as Naomi's family noticed that she wasn't responding to messages or calls, 
Her parents and siblings called Panasonic to ask whether Naomi had arrived for her shifter. And that's when their fears were cemented into cold, dark dread. According to her co-workers and Panasonic officials, Naomi failed to make it to her shift that day. Now, this was very unlikely for Naomi. She was a very responsible worker, and she took her job seriously. If she wanted to take a day off, she would have let her co-workers or managers know beforehand. So all of this was very weird and frightening, and almost immediately, the Irian family reported 18-year-old Naomi Irian missing. Fernley, Nevada is a fairly sizable city, and it's the seventh most populated city in Nevada. The population of Fernley totals about 25,000 people. Even though the city is not small or quaint by any means, the community is tight-knit, and everyone looks after each other. So to know that a young 18-year-old girl who was waiting to go to her job suddenly disappeared in the early hours of the morning, well, it was a shock to everyone. Well, three grueling days after Naomi disappeared, the police finally found something. It was Naomi's Mercury Sable, the car that she'd been sitting in while waiting for her shuttle on that fateful day. It was discovered deserted in an industrial area near Fernley, but there was nothing inside the car, not a single shred of evidence. Naomi was nowhere to be found, but the investigators did forensically analyze the car for any fingerprints, DNA, or other evidence. By this point, the search for Naomi had become huge news. There were not only ground searches, but also air searches, and everyone was clinging to the hope of finding Naomi alive and well. In fact, the FBI also got involved in Naomi's disappearance, and they worked together with the local police to find more evidence on this mysterious hooded man. While going through heaps of surveillance footage from the day that Naomi disappeared from the Walmart parking lot, the FBI also came forward with a reward of $10,000 for any credible information on Naomi and her whereabouts. And after some time, they received a tip. On March 29th, 17 days after Naomi's disappearance, a tip led the investigators to a rural area of Buena Vista Mine in Churchill County. Now, Churchill County was about 56 miles away from Fernley, where Naomi was last seen. And the site was dreadful, to say the least. It was a barren, desolate, and completely remote area. Upon surveying the vast and remote land of dry dirt, something caught the eye of the officers, and they examined the area as they approached what looked like disturbed and dug up mounds of dirt. The detectives immediately knew what they were looking at. It was a shallow grave, and upon digging, they discovered the disrobed body of a woman. It was later identified to be that of 18-year-old Naomi Irby. She tragically lost her life due to two fatal rounds, one to the head and one to the chest. Tragically, Naomi was also subjected to physical violence, and it was just so horrific. Naomi's lifeless body was immediately taken in for an autopsy, and meanwhile, the Irian family was made aware of the terrible news. For the Irian family, the news of finding Naomi's body, lifeless and exposed in a cold, shallow grave, was devastating beyond measure. Naomi was the light of their lives, and now they knew that they would never see her shining and happy face again. They were struck with unimaginable horror and sadness when Naomi went missing, but this revelation was completely different, and it was a crushing feeling. Naomi's brother, Casey, with whom she was living with in Fernley at the time of the case, expressed his grief on Facebook, saying, quote, I can't believe this. I'm at a loss for words. Naomi's parents were floored by this tragic and horrific news of their daughter's untimely passing. The Irian family knew that Naomi was gone, and this should have been a time for grieving for them. But more than anything, they knew that they had to make the perpetrator pay for their animalistic and senseless actions. The investigators and FBI also felt the same, and they were already closing in on a suspect who may have been behind Naomi's passing. So remember the CCTV footage from the night that Naomi disappeared? Well, detectives found something shocking and chilling. See, on March 12th, Naomi wasn't the only one in that Walmart parking lot. There was also someone else there. The surveillance footage showed a dark hooded man strolling around the parking lot. This man was wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt, dark pants or jeans, and dark tennis shoes. After some time, at around 5.24 a.m., the man was seen walking towards a 1992 Mercury Sable, which was, tragically, Naomi's car. The man was seen standing by the driver's side door for a bit before he casually opened the door and got in the driver's seat. Naomi was seen scooting over to the passenger seat 
visibly scared and frozen in fear before the car zipped right out of the parking lot. This man, according to many witnesses, was bald and he had a beard, and he drove a dark-colored Chevrolet Silverado truck. According to the FBI, the suspect was someone in his early 30s to 40s, and he had lived close by. Well, it didn't take police long at all to close in on this man, and he was actually arrested by the police four days before Naomi's body was discovered in Churchill County. Before police even knew what had happened to Naomi, they knew this man must have been behind it. And this man was 41-year-old Troy Driver. So who was Troy Driver? What was he doing in the Walmart parking lot so early on March 12th? And was this his first crime? Or was he some dangerous criminal and repeated offender? Well, horrifically, Troy Driver was not a stranger to violent crimes. In fact, he'd been pretty much dabbling in crime all of his life since he was very young. When he was only 12 years old, Troy was sentenced to community service for animal cruelty and killing, which really gives insight into how Troy was as a person. Not long after, in 1994, 14-year-old Troy got tangled with the law again, and this time it was for residential break-ins, stealing firearms, and burglarizing stores. He was sentenced to formal probation for his offenses, which was nothing but a slap on the wrist. But that wasn't all. Ten months later, Troy was removed from his home, and he was placed at the Shasta Youth Correctional Facility after he pointed a loaded gun at another boy, presumably trying to rob him. When his probation officer pressed him on why he did this, Troy said, quote, It's easier to rob someone than to work and earn money. According to Deputy Krupp, Troy only spiraled down from this point on. He was heavily abusing drugs at the young age of 15, and not long after, he became a regular drinker. But April of 1997 was the turning point in Troy's life, as he escalated from petty theft and armed robberies to being an accomplice in murder. See, Troy Driver had been sentenced to 15 years in prison in 1997. This was for taking part in taking the life of another teenager with a firearm, dumping the body of the victim along Highway 128, and lighting the victim's car on fire to get rid of the evidence. He was charged with robbery, burglary, and possessing a firearm, as well as being an accessory to a felony, and he proceeded to plead guilty to all charges in the summer of 1997. Troy, after serving his sentence, was released from prison in 2012 under parole supervision. But two years later, in 2014, he was then discharged from parole supervision as well because it was thought that he was no longer a danger to society. Well, Troy would prove that claim wrong because in March of 2022, he decided to act on his violent tendencies again and violently take the life of 18-year-old Naomi Iria. Before Naomi's disappearance and death, Troy was an excavator operator at the Buena Vista mine for lead core mining, and he was living with his girlfriend in Fallon. According to Troy's girlfriend, he said he was going camping on March 11th and 12th. Now, this wasn't alarming for Troy's girlfriend because he did this a lot and even left his phone at home. Later, Troy's girlfriend did come forward and disclose to the police that Troy had an unhealthy fascination with serial killers. He was reading books, listening to podcasts about them, everything. Alarmingly, he apparently also asked his girlfriend's daughter about the routines that the shuttle takes to and from Walmart, the same shuttle Naomi used to take to work, and other associated questions like how many people it took and what the timings of the shuttle were. Moreover, the DNA found on Naomi's body also matched that of Troy, so investigators knew without a shadow of a doubt that Troy was definitely responsible for Naomi's tragic passing. So the investigators immediately sprang into action, and on March 25th, 2022, 41-year-old Troy Driver was arrested from his home in Fallon. He was initially taken into custody on kidnapping charges, but later, as more and more evidence came up, he'd racked up charges of murder, first-degree kidnapping, robbery, burglary of a motor vehicle, and destruction of evidence. In July of 2022, after DNA evidence came out, Troy was also charged with sexual assault. Infuriatingly, Troy pleaded not guilty to all charges, and so a trial was to be held, dragging Naomi's family through a lengthy and pointless court battle. I mean, with the evidence police had against this guy, it's hard to imagine him even wasting his time trying to fight these charges in court. But according to the criminal complaint, it's speculated that Troy was loitering in the Walmart parking lot with a horrible motive, to end someone's life. And tragically, he set his sights on unsuspecting Naomi. 
He approached Naomi's car, somehow threatened her to let him in, and drove away with her. It's believed that he took Naomi to Churchill County's remote location, took advantage of her, and then ended her life on the spot with a firearm. Then he buried Naomi, left the scene, deserted Naomi's car, and got into his own truck, disposed of her phone, and then changed his tires as a way to, quite literally, cover up its tracks. While Troy was awaiting trial and being held at Lyon County Jail in Nevada, there were a couple of significant instances that occurred, but one of them impacted Naomi's case to a great extent. On October 18th of 2022, a confession letter was delivered to the detectives, and it was written by Troy. He had originally delivered it to his ex-girlfriend concealed in a deck of cards, but it was later turned into investigators in Naomi's case. Even though the letter wasn't made public, some excerpts of it included Troy saying things like, quote, I didn't know her until it was too late. Nothing I did was sexually motivated. Two days later, something significant happened. Troy tried to take the coward's way out, and he didn't want to face the law for his actions. So on August 20th, 2022, he tried to take his own life, but was unsuccessful. Troy spent the rest of 2022 juggling from jail cell to jail cell, with psychiatric evaluations in between. He was deemed stable and fit to stand trial in November of 2022, and he also denied having thoughts of ending his own life. Fast forward to March 7th of 2023, and Troy attempted to take his own life once again, this time by cutting himself, but he was again unsuccessful. During this time, he was also in isolation, and he voiced his disgust to a prison nurse about isolation being, quote, frustrating. And that's a pretty rich statement coming from such a cold-blooded killer. Anyway, in June of 2023, he was discharged from isolation and sent back to maximum security prison, and he was seemingly doing okay. On August 6, 2023, Troy was acting normally, and he went about his routine. According to deputies on hourly check duty, Troy was visibly calm at around 5.22 p.m. But an hour later, at about 6.17 p.m., another prison check was conducted, and Troy was found lifeless in his cell, and he couldn't be revived. 43-year-old Troy Driver, Naomi's kidnapper and killer, had successfully taken his own life. His cause of death was deemed asphyxiation. This struck Naomi's family with another devastating blow. Now, not only had this man claimed the life of their daughter, but now he'd face no repercussions for his actions, at least not in this life. A press conference following Troy's death was held in which Lyon County Sheriff Brad Pope passed on his deepest condolences to the Erian family. He also went on to say, quote, I've seen the insurmountable evidence against Troy Driver. I know that Troy Driver was a coward who preyed on the vulnerability of an innocent young woman that was Naomi Erian. Even though everyone wanted to see Troy get punished in prison and sentenced to life, Troy left everyone from the Erian family to the dejected police officers and sheriffs feeling hopeless. Sheriff Brad Pope also stated, quote, Troy Driver proved he was the coward I knew him to be when he took his own life instead of facing justice. And he ended the press conference with a message directed to none other than the monster himself, saying, quote, I have no empathy for the damned soul of Troy Driver. Naomi Erian was only 18 years old when her life was cut short by a pathetic excuse of a person who was just scouting a parking lot looking for anyone to hurt. She was known for being a beautiful soul who was a source of warmth and happiness for her loved ones. And now her mom, Diana, won't get to see her graduate college, start her life, or even build a future for herself. Naomi's end-of-life celebration was held on April 10th, 2022. And according to Diana, it looked like the whole community had gathered in a small space to celebrate the joy that was Naomi. Naomi's brother Casey, a Navy veteran and Apple employee, extended his heartfelt and genuine thanks to the people of Fernley during this harrowing time by stating, quote, I can't imagine how much more unbearable this would have been without the community support that we had. Diana thought back on her daughter's wonderful memories, and she wanted to celebrate her life one last time that she knew in her heart that Naomi wouldn't want it to be any other way. A GoFundMe was also arranged for Naomi's funeral, and it got very close to its goal to give Naomi a proper farewell. Naomi was a person who looked at the brighter side of things, and she hated wasting her precious time being sad or upset. Diana knew for sure that Naomi would have wanted to make the world a better place with her light and warmth, but sadly, she was taken away far too soon.
Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Dave H. and Donna. If you also want to become a member of the channel, you'll gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can help support the channel and help out. I really appreciate those of you who have decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video, or find the link in the description. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.